It seemed like every time that I turned on the television, the news media was always reporting on the same problems in the world. They would report on America's healthcare crisis, where one in three Americans are obese, and one in 10 have diabetes, or glaciers melting from environmental pollution. I was tired of hearing about the same problems year after year after year. So I decided I wanted to find the people who are taking action to improve either their personal health or the health of our environment. I started my quest by interviewing doctors about obesity. I wanted to better understand the problem. How big is the obesity problem in America? It's really big. <laughs> So the obesity problem in America is absolutely getting worse, and it's been heading in that direction for a number of years. I think the obesity problem in America, as much as I'd like to think it's getting better, is at best plateauing. So how does America's obesity problem compare to the rest of the world? According to the Central Intelligence Agency World Factbook, 34% of Americans are obese. And in China, only 3% of their population is obese. You know, the diets that we're living, the stressed out lifestyles we're living, the electronic lifestyles we're living, the lack of exercise are the causes of the modern chronic diseases. I think the role of food and obesity as well as acute and chronic disease is key. I think it's probably the most important thing. And if we don't look at that and we don't start changing it, we're number one, if goes all, everything goes back to economy, we're going to go bankrupt. In 2008, medical spending attributed to obesity was $147 billion. But second of all, and even more important to people's lives, is we're going to die younger. Um, the next generation is thought to be maybe the first generation that won't live as long as their parents did. 300,000 Americans die each year from obesity. So much attention is being paid to obesity around our country. Uh, so much funding from National Institutes of Health and other research organizations are going towards obesity research uh, to try to figure out how to best deal with this problem in our country. So it's a huge issue for our nation. Some people even argue that it is a a national security issue. There are definitely people on the uh, military side of our society who want to see our population more fit. National government has actually done, you know, evaluations even for the military of our national defense concerns for our obesity epidemic in this country. That, docu that document exists and it's on public knowledge and I've actually, you know, downloaded it off the internet. So that does exist and our government and our country is very aware and our medical institutions, uh, you know, the American Medical Association, the American Osteopathic Association, are very, very, very concerned about the obesity epidemic that's out there. When I see somebody who is obese or has a problem with fat metabolism, I'm not so concerned that, oh, well, you know, you're getting fat and we have to do something because you're getting fat or that you are fat. My concern is, how, what is your body telling you and me about what's going on internally. It's saying that something, you are not getting something. So if your food doesn't have the nutrients that your body needs, why wouldn't you be hungry? You are hungry. So eat more stuff. But the stuff you eat does, still doesn't have the nutrients. I wanted to learn more about the challenges of being overweight. So I met with Jessica, who is about to start a 12-week program for better health. Not everybody who's overweight is leave it, living this life of like gluttony that you know that's not always the case so I think people make a lot of assumptions and judgments about you and treat you very different um, when you're not that you know model picture of, of a woman. Are you at a greater risk for a heart attack right now? I would assume I, I mean I do have high blood pressure and I know that the first time I ever saw that on a paper, no doctor had called me that. And I looked at papers at the doctor's office and saw morbid obesity. I was horrified <laughs> because I never would have classified myself that way. Um, but diabetes is a higher risk. The risks are the longer I keep this weight on, 
the higher the chances are of me getting, I mean, even cancer is, has been linked to being obese. And so I just, I just said this has to, I need to be around for my kids. I can't tell you, I, I don't know if a study, but um, anecdotally, uh, we see that there is an awful lot of obesity associated with women who have breast cancer. So the consequences of obesity are future health risks. So we worry about a number of different things when someone is gaining weight too rapidly. We worry about heart health, blood pressure, cholesterol levels. We worry about diabetes, sleep apnea, which is when you have pauses in your respirations during sleep. There's a myriad of other issues. There's a very strong relationship also between obesity and cancer risk. I think the health crisis in America definitely relates to obesity, but obesity isn't the problem. Obesity is the symptom and the sign. So obesity is what happens from everything else that's going on. So related to obesity, and if you go backwards and look at obesity as a result of problems relating to insulin and high circulating insulin, then you can look at the fact that so many tumors have insulin receptors. Breast cancer has insulin receptors. Those insulin receptors don't seem to develop insulin resistance. So in a high carbohydrate environment where you have to have high insulin levels all the time, what does that say for your tumor growth? It feeds the tumor. What's going to be the game plan? Game plan is for Jessica and I to connect, find out what her goals are, find out what's um, motivating her and what's stopping her, and working through um, any uh, limiting factors and tapping into the exciting pieces of it, and um, just really structured goals and sticking to a game plan. And a lot of people try to, to lose weight, but a lot of people fail. Why do you think that is? They usually they don't stick to it because life sets in and usually you're the last person that gets taken care of. There's kids, there's family, there's work, you know, there's other loved ones. Everybody is crunched for time and usually that's the first thing that goes. And, and it's not a matter of people, you know, not wanting it and not being willing to stick to it. It's just the time commitment and the and the drive to stick to what you say you're going to do. Then, I met with Daryl, who is also starting a 12-week fitness program. From doctor visits over the years, I ended up with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, so I ended up going on meds for those, which I, I'd rather not take meds, you know, every day for the rest of my life. Um, so there's a lot of things going on that, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious. I mean, you know, walk up two flights of stairs and be out of breath. I mean, all those things, you know, make it pretty obvious that I needed to get in shape. Daryl starts his fitness program by meeting with Maria Glad. She's a registered nurse and wellness coach. She's establishing a baseline for measuring Daryl's progress in the weeks ahead. So I wish that I had a pill that made everybody turn into, you know, a healthy, lean person. And if someone ever invents that pill, you know, they will be able to retire early. I think obesity is so complicated. The physiology of obesity is so complex, there probably is no such pill to be invented. What I tell my patients is, we do have that medicine, and it's called good eating and exercise. After six weeks, I check back in with Jessica and Daryl. weekend, Daryl plants an apple tree with his family. He's planting this tree to celebrate his successful weight loss so far.
after exercising and eating healthily for 12 weeks, I checked back in with Daryl and Jessica to see their final results. Get the scale ready. It's right next to you. And you're going to wait for the green light. Alrighty. You did it! Yes! <laughs> 215.8. Wow. Yay! You did it. In just 12 weeks, Jessica has lost 16 pounds and Daryl has lost 20 pounds. And your BMI started out at 37.9 and it is now 33. And I know you went and saw your primary care doctor. You were able to get off your statin. Your physician said you're going to be evaluated in six months to come off high blood pressure medication. I think it was exciting for me because I remember when I started, I told you that a 3.0 on the treadmill was like a full run for me. Yep. And then I was warming up and it was easily easy. doing a 3.2. Are the results with Daryl abnormal or, or could other people do this? Is this? Oh, other people definitely do this. But my knees feel better than they did. My back feels better, you know, so there's there's lots of other benefits. Loved the experience and I thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah. I think even every time I met with you, you pushing me to say, no, you need to go up you know, to a higher weight. Yep. I might not have done that on my own, you know, yep. or known that it was okay to do that on my own, so I think that was a huge, huge help. You know, the way he talks about how he thinks about food differently now than he ever did before, how he plans um, for things, it, it tells me that he's made some real changes that he's incorporated. So sometimes those small choices, a series of small choices, you know, can have as big an impact as, you know, just one thing. You know, I don't snack at night, and you know, if I do snack, I'm probably grabbing an apple or a banana. I'm not grabbing, a, you know, I used to say, well, I'll have a couple of chips. Well, you sit down with a bag, and the next thing you know, oh, look, the chips are gone. You know, and it's 10 o'clock at night. You know, it's just, so again, it's a series of small choices. Start making them, tell people what you're doing, and, and track your progress and stick to it. these trees symbolize to you? Why are they important to you? Well, I think it gives us access to healthy snacks. Every day the kids come home and want a snack and I'm excited that maybe next fall we'll be able to say, grab an apple off the backyard. It's good for the environment because some trees are getting cut down every day. Yeah. What fruit trees do I get next? We talked about Pe pear. pear. I'm encouraged to see that obesity can be overcome by eating healthily and exercising. But what about diabetes, a disease which affects roughly 1 in 10 Americans? I don't know anything about diabetes, so I decide to meet with some families that are affected by it. I want to learn about diabetes, and I want to learn what action can be taken to stop it. In your pancreas, there's this medicine called insulin, or like and your body generates it, and it breaks down the insulin into energy. But when the pancreas fails, that's called diabetes. And there's type 1 and type 2 diabetes, My, and Cole has type 1. So, and so he can't, the, his body can't really generate insulin, so he can't um, really he can't eat anything without giving himself more insulin and so you can do that with a shot or you can do it with a pump which Cole yeah. has. Do you want to show them? Sure. I have an insulin pump here. Kind of. Yeah. It like he and it goes into George. And it goes into my body right here. And it just it's a little catheter that goes below the skin and that delivers the insulin into my body. And, and so how does his diabetes affect your family? What, how do your lives change after the diagnosis? <laughs> well, it certainly was a big change uh, early on. Uh, we were admitted to the hospital only briefly for a day or two, and, uh, and then we came home, and we started with uh, the idea of counting carbohydrates. This was new for us, and paying attention to exactly what we eat, and uh, not just for Cole, but for the whole family. Blood sugar, I check it every two hours to make sure it's at a good level and m more often even if I'm playing sports or running around outside. 
I think, it, and it's, it's, I think the rest of our kids are also a lot more aware of foods. All carbohydrates, if you will, are not created equal. So, you know, eating a pizza combo and eating an apple, while they might have the same calories or even the same carbs, um, are not the same thing. All right, Cole, what do you have right there? Well, this is my blood sugar checker, and I use this to tell what my blood sugar is, and then I use the number to figure out how to correct for my blood sugar. So how does it work? Well, first of all, you take a little strip from this little canister, I guess, and it kind of looks like that, and you put it into the meter. You have to wait a little bit for it to go through, like, just getting prepared to take the blood. And then in here, there's um, a little needle. It kind of looks like that, and then you pull it back, and just press it into a finger and it will get some blood to come out and you kind of squeeze the finger get blood out and you put it on the end of the test strip and then it reads 54321 and my number right now is a 70 and with the number being a 70 do you have to do anything now because of that? Um, well usually if I was just staying here and sitting around and stuff I would have a few crackers or so to get it up a little bit, but not overshoot it and get make it high. So then, if I was playing sports or was active or anything, I would usually have more juice and sugar to bring it up a lot, because running and exercise tends to make my number go down. There's no known cure for type 1 diabetes, but it can be mitigated by taking insulin, measuring blood sugar, exercising, and eating healthily. I watch as Cole's family plants two more apple trees in their home orchard. The Miranda Levitt Diabetes Fund um, is in memory of my daughter Miranda who passed away from um, complications with juvenile diabetes. Miranda was 22 years old when she passed away. Well, I think in every aspect of her life um, with juvenile diabetes, um, healthy diet is key to ma maintaining your level of your, your average blood sugar. Um, is it's very key in the amount of insulin you take. Um, the more you eat unhealthy, the more insulin that you're going to have to take to bring your blood sugars in check. And the you know obviously if she ate healthy, it you know the amount of insulin she would have to administer would be a lot less. And this is a book that I had written. Um, actually, Miranda wrote um, a lot of the information in the book. Just talks about. Um, what diabetes meant to Miranda. Um, it, it, we termed it a dictionary for a life with diabetes. And in simplistic terms, it talks about what type 1 diabetes, um, what type 1 diabetes is, and um, in, that would be the definition and Miranda's definition of type 1 diabetes. So, so Miranda wrote um, this book, you said? In her, her I I picked out pages from her diary okay. that we still have. Wow. Um, and for instance, type 1 diabetes, a long and bald term, but very simply put, um, type 1 diabetes, through Miranda's eyes, in her diary, she refers to, I'm no, no, no longer a normal kid. I have to prick my finger five to six times a day. Then I have to give myself shots in the stomach three times a day. And to top it all off, I'm afraid of needles. I can't eat the same foods other kids eat anymore. And now my mom and dad have to worry about me all the time. Brenda is planting an apple tree in memory of her daughter.
As I leave Brenda's house, my heart goes out to her and to her family for their loss. I never realized how serious type 1 diabetes could be. I'm shocked. After meeting with Cole and Brenda, I now realize type 1 diabetes is the more rare form, and it can't be prevented. Now I turn my focus to type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes represents the most common form of diabetes in the world. So when we're talking about diabetes in adults, most of them have type 2 diabetes. And that usually, not always, but usually is connected to having excess weight. What diabetes means is your body can no longer control blood sugar. We all need sugar in our body as a source of fuel. It's the fundamental source of fuel. Most of the things that we eat turn into sugar. And um, when you have type 2 diabetes, you are resistant to the hormone insulin. So insulin is what you need to control sugars in your body, to utilize sugars in your body. When you have type 2 diabetes, you make lots of insulin, but it doesn't work anymore. So anyone with extra weight starts to go down this path of insulin being made at very high levels and not working as well as it should in the body. These maps are from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On the left side, you can see the percentage of Americans who are obese. On the right side, you can see the percentage of Americans who are diagnosed with diabetes. The Southeast U.S. leads the nation in poor health on both maps. There is also a clear correlation between high rates of obesity and high rates of diabetes. So the most serious complications of diabetes stem from uh, vascular disease and by that we mean the blood vessels start not working as well as they should. Blood vessels start to become narrow and that happens in small blood vessels and large blood vessels. So you start to see things like the heart not working well or heart attacks in poorly controlled diabetes. You start to see things where the small blood vessels go which is in your hands and feet. That's why many people think of amputations and foot problems in people with diabetes. That's very much a risk. Your kidneys are very sensitive to blood sugar and over time if the blood vessels going to the kidneys are damaged you start to get into kidney failure. The eyes are also very sensitive. So we talk about vascular disease and diabetes as being a major problem, heart attacks, amputations, also eye disease and kidney disease as the major problems that we see as a complication of diabetes. I have neuropathy, very bad my feet. Um, I can hardly feel my feet. As it went on, I had more trouble with my legs. Do you think that Americans are aware of diabetes? Do you think there's enough awareness in America of this problem? No, I don't think there is. Things got worse, and they said that I'd have to lose one. And my right one went first. And how old were you when they, um, when they took that one? Forty. 40. 40, 45, I guess. So when you were 40 or 45, they, they, they cut off one of your legs? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and then did the problem go away after that, or no? Yeah, it seemed to for a while. Yeah. And then the other one started, so it was about a year and a half later the left one went. Well, there's a lot of things I can't do, yeah. like reach the top of the cupboard or anything. Yeah. So I have to have help with some of that stuff, and I try to have things down where I can reach most of it. I think all people think, oh, I'm not going to get that. Yeah. Why is it important for you to plant a fruit tree? What does that fruit tree symbolize to you? That's going to um, remind me every time I see that about diabetes and eating healthy. Do you think the tree will help you eat more healthy just, just seeing it? I or? hope so. You know, I try very hard, even though I look very obese. You know, if I could exercise and do stuff, you know, it would be much better. But That's awesome. Yes, I really think, you know, looking at it, it's going to inspire me. I hope it does. Do you wish that you could, you know, warn other Americans about how serious this is? 
Well, I think just looking at me, most people realize, but you don't see a lot of people, so in my everyday life around here, because so, yeah. I don't get out too much the way I am. I admire Loretta for her positive attitude, despite having endured such hardship. After meeting Loretta, it occurs to me, maybe the reason Americans don't realize how serious diabetes is, is because diabetics like her and Jane don't often get out in public. I wonder if there's any hope for stopping diabetes. So diabetes can be reversible and uh, type 2 diabetes, because it is more related to weight, uh, often is reversible if a person gets healthier. It's, this is especially true in the young patients that I treat as a pediatric endocrinologist. So we absolutely have kids who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. They may be very sedentary, they may have extra weight, and if we get them going on some positive changes in their life, eating more fruits and vegetables, exercising more, some of these simple fundamental things, they can totally reverse their physiology to a point where they don't need the medicines that I'm prescribing anymore. So it's absolutely reversible. I was uh, diagnosed with diabetes uh, a while back, and the way I got rid of it was to change the diet. Change the diet, change your attitude, and then everything came around the right way. But as long as you go into the store, and you have them make your dinner for you, or you pick up the boxes of stuff and you don't cook your own things, the processed stuff causes this to happen. And did you have type one or type two diabetes? Type two. Wow. And now it's gone? It's gone. That's incredible. Yeah. Congratulations. It's encouraging to know there are people taking action to overcome obesity and diabetes there is some hope for improving the health of humanity. But now, I wonder, is there any hope for improving the health of our environment? Next, I meet with several environmental experts. I want to better understand environmental pollution. The obesity epidemic, the diabetes epidemic, really is sort of a, a sign that we have developed an unhealthy relationship with food. Um, we've become very reliant on um, processed and industrial foods. But the, the whole food system is built around uh, oil, right from the planting to the shipping and so forth. The way that we produce food now is um, reliant very heavily on fossil fuels. Um, the, the calculation or the equation is that it takes about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of food energy in a highly industrialized food system like the one we have here in the United States. Um, so that's one of the, the reasons that you know, people could be concerned, that we, the way that we're eating right now is not good for the climate. According to the Capital Area Food Bank of Washington, D.C., on average, Fresh fruit travels 2,416 miles before being consumed. No, there's certainly not enough environmental consciousness today. Um, we're just consuming resources at an alarming rate and not really thinking about what impact it's having on, on the environment. And so a negative externality, right, is something like uh, carbon, which is a greenhouse gas, and when emitted it contributes to climate change. Well, there's no tax on carbon. There's no, uh, well, start, there are regulations starting to come out in California and other places, but up until recently, industry could pump out as much carbon as it wanted, and uh, it wasn't polluting. That wasn't considered to be a pollutant at all. So that's a negative externality that goes into something like transporting your tomato from Mexico or California or somewhere else all the way across the country or into the United States. It's not built into the cost of the food, right? Uh, so we can have a, what I'd call an artificially low price for those essential commodities. According to the United States Department of Agriculture and Economic Research Service, Americans imported 38 billion pounds of fruits and nuts in 2009. I wonder how many gallons of gasoline were burned to import 38 billion pounds of food in a single year. 
And then I wonder, what would the total number of gallons be over the course of my entire lifetime? For the first time in the history of our species, we have probably the lowest percentage of our population involved in the production of some of its own food. The lowest, you know, if you think about it, in the U.S., I believe in 2006, it hit its lowest point in terms of people who identified as being gardening at that time. It, it might have gone up a little bit since the recession, but the lowest number of humans, percentage-wise, actively engaged in, in some of their own food production. Is that a risk, you think? What do you think? The negative externality, that cost that's not built into the price of that piece of fruit, is eventually going to catch up with us. Um, you know, I, for us, you know, the most recent thing we've looked at is the oil crisis in the Gulf of Mexico, where in 2010 you had, uh, I can't remember the number, but an extremely high amount of oil from the BP well exploding, released in the Gulf of Mexico. And you think, you know, that's one of our biggest fisheries. That's where a lot of um, marine species go to reproduce. And maybe we shouldn't be drilling there. I mean, you know, part of it is you think, okay, maybe we started drilling there and that was okay. But now that we've really screwed it up, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. And um, the first year we, 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 we launched a voyage right after it happened and we couldn't get that close. Got within a couple miles of the epicenter of the accident. Um, because there were, there were a lot of ships cleaning it up and trying to make things better. The next year we got right on top of the epicenter and it was like a desert on the ocean. There was no wildlife, there was nothing for as far as you could see. It was really kind of an eerie experience and you think about, you know, a number of people died right there. Um, but the following year, last year, we went out and there's now four rigs right around where, where that one exploded. And so we don't seem to learn from our mistakes. I think we are currently living in a time of a, sort of a broad spectrum of environmental concerns that are very much linked to our economic practices, our land use practices. Some people would bundle them under an umbrella term of biodevastation, which has to do with the degradation of soil, water, air, sort of species diversity, habitat diversity. But right now, our environment is, is laden with lots of different chemicals um, from industry, from everyday use, um, that accumulate in the environment. It's, it's quite dire. There's no, there's no two, two ways about it. And even though some rivers in the U.S. might be cleaner than they were in the 70s, for example, uh, we may certainly have exported our environmental problems to other parts of the world, which is equally reprehensible. So I think, you know, looking at root causes and taking a systems approach, we need to, to look at this whole spate of problems and identify underlying causes and really shift those as much as possible. You know, one of the things that get lost in the global warming climate change discussion, we focus a lot on our carbon output. Um, and you know that that as a, as a human society, we've been producing more and more carbon, and that's what's creating a lot of the problem, which is true. But part of the equation we don't talk about is that we've lost a lot of trees, we've cleared a lot of forest. Um, I was just out in uh, at a conference in San Francisco and looking back at the city and seeing the the amazing number of houses that are crammed on. You know, when you when you when you're in San Francisco Bay and you're looking at the city, there's just houses everywhere and hardly any trees. And you think back, once upon a time, that was probably all covered with trees. Um, and we've just cleared out so many trees that the trees aren't there to pull the carbon out of the air that we're producing. And so I think I think we're affecting it on both sides. We're producing too much carbon, and we're eliminating the trees and plants to pull the carbon out. After talking to the environmental experts, it's clear that humanity is burning fossil fuels to ship food vast distances. Humanity is also polluting the air with carbon dioxide. But the good news is that by planting fruit trees locally, we can reduce the gasoline used to ship food. Furthermore, through photosynthesis, trees convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. It's clear to me now that planting fruit trees is part of a long-term solution to cleaning our environment. If we're serious about cleaning our environment, 
then we need every single neighborhood in America to plant fruit trees. But is that realistic? All right, so Pat, um, what's happened here? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I uh, came home yesterday and walked out on my back porch to, I think there were 48 trees that I counted, and my husband was nowhere in sight, and I was just thinking, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> And uh, we had been talking about getting some fruit trees, dwarf-sized ones that uh, we could... Just a few. Well, yeah, we, you know, <laughs> a couple of apples, a, a couple of peaches, a couple of pears, a couple of cherries, you know, just enough for us. We're only two of us, we don't need a whole lot. And we wanted to have berries and bushes and that sort of thing, so... I was assuming that this was part of the plan, <laughs> but I was kind of surprised when I saw everything. In fact, I started laughing out loud when I <laughs> saw this yesterday. Uh, and then asked him where, called him and asked him where he was, and he was at the store buying more. <laughs> sort of like, okay. <laughs> Wondering how it was going to be paid for and stuff, but besides the point, <laughs> you know, what were we going to do with these things? That's when he said that he was planning on, you know, going to neighbors and trying to figure out who would want to support such a thing. And, and Pat, what do you think is going to be the neighborhood reception? Are you worried at all or no? Oh, worried isn't, I'm not worried, but I'm hopeful that people would, would want some of these trees. I just think it would be really cool to be, uh, you know, the the fruit tree capital of Portland, you know, Rosemont fruit tree. Who knows, maybe they'll change the name of the street, you know? Two days later, I attend a meeting at Alistair and Pat's house, where they share their vision with their neighbors. The permits are just if we plan on the esplanade, is that right? Right. So what's, yeah. what's your timeline with these with the, these trees that are sitting in bags in your backyard? They need to be in the ground within one to two weeks. Oh, okay. So, and I think it's doable. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's doable. How, think it how long is the permit process? That's why I'm meeting with... Uh, so you'll get a sense on Wednesday of how right. long it would take to get there. Right. It's about addressing all of these things. Peak oil, climate change, economic instability, um, wage, uh, wage issues. It's about creating food security in a sense. Food prices have been increasing. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in the past 10 years, the national average cost of apples has increased by 38% per pound. Broccoli is up 87%, chicken prices are up 98%, and dried beans are up 93%. Uh, I just see this as a, a great way of bonding and being closer. And I wasn't joking when I said about the party for, you know, like the, the uh, cider press. I have, I have this mm. vision of a, of a giant cider press party, you know, where we get together as a neighborhood yeah. and rent a press and people bring whatever fruits they want pressed into. Find out where the interest is and identify where people would want trees. Get their contact information. Ten days later, I watched the neighbors come together to plant fruit trees at dozens of houses on the street. They plant 49 fruit trees in just a couple of hours. Are there people in other neighborhoods who are also taking action? On a Saturday morning, I noticed my new neighbors planting fruit trees. 
I grab my camera and run over to interview them. I want to understand why they're planting trees. Important. I'm, I'm excited about growing fruit. So I'm looking forward to three years from now having all kinds of fruit to eat. Cool. Have you ever done this before? I have not. I'm new to this. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people had that knowledge. Uh, my grandmother back in the 30s and 40s, you know, um, during the Depression, times were hard. Um, you know, like a lot of uh, people at that time, she, she had a kitchen garden going and, and kept chickens. And, and, uh, and even as a child, I remember this is, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, I remember my grandmother canning. And um, we just moved into this house, so there's, you know, just all kinds of stuff to do. And, um, and so, the, the, and this is only part of it. So I've got fruit trees, I started um, a couple of raised beds to grow vegetables, and I've got um, a big compost pile going that I, I'm managing. I'm doing the hot compost so I can throw in all my cheese and meat and bones and whatnot from yeah. the table. I think if I just mix this up a little bit, put some of that stuff that was in it back. No, 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 don't get yourself all messy, bud. All right. Run, run, run. Oh, the soil is so badly drained in a lot of the yard that I, you know anything I would I tried to plant right on at the at, you know on the ground would get waterlogged. So you know trying to do something to um, and, it, and it's really helping. The beds are very well drained. So I put in two four by eight. Um, ideally, so if we thought of that as a as like a you know a four by uh, sixteen, I'd like to put in uh, something in the order of about a dozen more beds of that extent, a little bit more perhaps. So maybe next year I'll put in two four by 20 beds. For some folks it's like getting off the grid or you know um, being self-reliant, but, but whatever your, your, your political bent is, I mean, I think that, that it's, it's amazing exercise. I mean, I, I work my tail off, you know, like turning my compost pile the other day and digging this hole on a hot day. Um, you know, ordinarily I'd have to go and do field archeology span to, to get this kind of work, so that's good. Sure. Um, and so I'm doing all this exercise, um, which is going to yield food that I can eat. And if I, if, I, if I maintain it right, so like composting, everything, lawn clippings, everything off my table, seaweed, I'm trying to put nutrients into the soil to produce the healthiest possible food that I can. I, I, could not, I can grow stuff that I could not afford to buy on my salary as, a, as an educator, for sure. Because you can like eat apples from their branches. See, these... These are about to be apples, see? See, these are, they're going to be little circles, then they're going to be into these big things. I notice another neighbor of mine has a mature pear tree in their yard. I stop by because I want to find out what it's like to have free fruit. Well, I like the pears on it. Really? Mm-hmm. How do they taste, Sky? Kind of um, yucky on um, the skin. But how's the inside? Yummy. Yeah, and what did you do? What did you and Daddy do with your pears? Cut the skin mm -hmm. off. And you brought them to share, right? Yeah. With who? With my friends. How many chemicals have you sprayed on this past year? Absolutely none. None. Zero chemicals. And how many hours did you spend this past year pruning this tree to maintain it? How many hours have we spent? Pruning or maintaining it? Do you have to do a lot of work on the tree, pruning? The only work I have to do is to pick the pears. I, I thought you let Sky pick the pears. That's right, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, Absolutely no work. And and uh, and Sky, uh, how much work is it to pick a pear? Is it a lot of work? Is it hard? Um, not really. Is it fun? Yes. And how many pounds of, of pears do you think you'll get from this tree this year? Uh, we'll probably get one now. laundry basket full, uh, bushel. How many pounds of pears? That's a good question. Probably about... Be careful of your head. I'd say 55 pounds. If my neighbors get 55 pounds of free fruit from this tree each year, and if pears cost $1 per pound, that means over the next 20 years, they'll get $1,100 in free food from this tree. And that doesn't even take into account inflation, or the possible increase in the fruit tree yield. Have you guys considered how much money you're going to save by having this tree to provide you free fruit for the, next, the rest of your lives? That's a good question also. The savings are limitless because you don't need to take cash to the store. You don't need to withdraw money at your ATM machine. All you have to do is walk out here and get your food or 
you can make your own pies at home by just picking the pears, etc. How about you, Jen? For me, the value of Sky having access to a tree like this isn't really monetary. Like she gets to follow the growth of the pear. She gets to have the whole sense experience of being outside and watching it grow and being patient. Blah. Blah. When I was and picking younger, a pear. When I was younger, during Sky's age, I used to ride my bicycle all over the neighborhoods, and I'd get really, really hungry. And I wouldn't have any money to stop at the market to get, you know, fuel for the fire in the stomach. So you, it's always nice to know where the, the nearest fruit tree is where you can just make a pit stop. Dawn and her family are also new to the area. I meet with her because I want to understand why her family planted six fruit trees as soon as they moved into their new house. All right, so uh, Dawn, where are we right now? We're in my little orchard and... I have six little trees that we just planted this spring. And uh, it sounds like you just moved this house recently, right? We did. It was a year ago, June. And there was really nothing existing here in the way of gardens or um, set up. So we planted the six little trees that we have and put a deer fence around them. As we were told by the neighbors, they won't last a day without a deer fence. Yeah. It started when we lived in Hawaii a couple of years ago. I learned that over 90% of the food that Hawaiians eat was being brought in across the ocean in cargo containers and I realized that we were vulnerable that we didn't have any available food really um, and having small children that concerned me. One of the things that really intrigues me about your situation here is that you planted these trees just after moving in here. Um, can you can you elaborate on the impetus for doing that? You, you first move into a house, boom, you're planting trees right away. Why is it so urgent to you? Yeah, I guess, well, I had done enough reading to know that you can't put an apple tree in the ground and get those apples right away. Um, it takes time and a few years sometimes, so it seemed like a good vision and something to do early on and not to put off. I've seen a lot of people planting fruit trees, but I still don't know the best way for growing them. So I traveled to New Hampshire to meet with the guru of orchards, Michael Phillips. want to learn his techniques for growing organic fruit. Michael is the author of the book, The Holistic Orchard. Over the past 25 years, Michael has planted over 500 fruit trees. He currently manages about 240 on his property. You can plant fruit trees in both late fall and early, early spring. Now, when you're further north like I am here in New Hampshire, um, say zone 5, zone 4, zone 3 for sure, spring planting is a better bet just because if you don't take enough care and you leave air pockets, the tree is just as likely to be pushed out by the frost action heaving and thawing the ground. The first thing you need to do in planting a fruit tree and really wanting to give it all the advantage it can get is to dig a good sized hole. So here I'm talking on something on the order of 30, 36 inches across and 16, 18 inches deep. Now that's probably bigger than your root system, but what you're doing is you're loosening the earth for those roots to get a toe hold into the, the soil. Another thing you want to do is, is provide certain minerals. So rock phosphate, azomite clay, which has all kinds of trace minerals, can be really valuable to give that tree the things it needs to get going. What you don't want to do is super enrich that hole. Take out all the native soil and put in great compost. Maybe up to 25% could be compost in poor soil. But what happens, the roots kind of get this sense of, hey, it's really great to be in this particular hole this guy dug. And then they reach the edge and say, it's not so nice out there. I'm not going any further. And it's almost like creating a pot. So you don't want to get away from the character of the native soil totally. What you will do over time is build good soil from the top down, just like nature does. So as mulches decompose and you spread compost, that's where you're building the soil for the long term. And the ideal thing for fruit trees and for berries, um, nut trees as well, is what is known as ramiel wood chips. And this is a concept that came to us from Quebec. This particular pile comes from a landscape buddy who dumped a day's work here. You can go to the landscape center, but typically most of the wood mulch you'll find there is 
soft wood derived. It's either the bark of trees that are used to make mill out two by fours and framing lumber, or sometimes it's hemlock um, or cedar. Well, none of that is the hardwood deciduous type material I'm talking about when I talk about Ramiel wood chips. This is something you're either gonna make it on your own, you're gonna have a landscape friend, you're gonna look for those people who clear along the roads or under the power lines and somehow get them to dump a load at your house. That's a real treasure. I get around to spreading the Ramiel wood chip mulch either in the fall after the harvest or in early spring. And in the fall, there's a number of important things going on underneath the apple tree. Now, the leaves are not quite off. Most of this work is going to take place at that point. But what I want to do is really help the biology get those leaves decomposed, because the leaves are going to carry over some of the disease organisms till next spring. So when I come in and dump a load of wood chips on top of fallen leaves, um, I'm not trying to mulch the tree the way we think of in the garden or in a very neat yard. I'm, I'm emulating nature's ways, and a branch falls here, uh, leaves pile up here because the wind blew them there. And these wood chips are going to decompose over the course of two, three years and suppress the growth in this area. All kinds of plants out in the orchard help create the orchard ecosystem. And, and one of the really stalwarts, as far as I'm concerned, is a medicinal herb called comfrey. Now, comfrey is a, what permaculture people would call a dynamic accumulator. It has a big, deep taproot. And that taproot, in turn, is bringing up minerals from the subsoil, which go into the leaf of the comfrey, which when the plant falls over and decomposes, that calcium is made available to the tree. So it's mining from deeper down. Comfrey is basically a living mulch plant. It's, there's been about three rounds of growth this season. And you can even see one of the earlier rounds has fallen over. Well, that, that helps suppress growth. And that just makes a little bit more room for the feeder roots of the fruit trees. This blackness is a fungi feeding on the surface. Now, I have a friend who actually says, my apples come with a free coating of probiotics. Another way of looking at it is it's, it's an edible mushroom. But if it bothers you, the point is, with a wet cloth or even a little spit, you can rub it off. It, it's, it's not an issue. It's, it's, it's benign. When a fruit grower grafts, because we graft not only apples, but also pears and cherries and plums and peaches, what we are doing is taking one or two buds from the variety that we want, and we are essentially splicing it in to another root system. These are some of the trees I grafted three springs ago. And these will be being planted out in a orchard at official spacing uh, next spring. They're rather big, but they're very healthy and they're very robust. They've been growing in a Ramio wood chip mulch bed. When this was all the size of a pencil in diameter, I grafted a short piece of wood onto a rootstock. And that splice was made right in this vicinity. You can kind of see a swelling right here. That's where the graft union was. So everything that's grown since is all this hard cider variety. It's one of the bittersweets. And those two buds that were on that piece of wood called a scion, um, I let one of those buds develop a shoot. Now three years later, there's the beginning of branches. That is the birthing of a tree. 100, 200 years ago, most people had some connect, more of a connection with the land. And having two, four, even 12 fruit trees in your yard was part of your home food system. You know, I've seen this map put together by the uh, New York Extension people, showing a black dot for every 100 apples in New York State 150 years ago. And the state is practically evenly distributed with black dots. Flash forward to, I think the year of this publication was like 1972, and you see some black dots, a few dozen along the Great Lake Shore, and some in the Hudson Valley. But really the heart of the state has been emptied because people have made that transition to the modern lifestyle. This vision of, of many different families getting involved with growing their own fruit and their own vegetables, all the types of foods we can grow, but particularly fruit, was common 150 years ago. And we've fallen away from that, letting the commercial trade grow our fruit because it's more convenient.
fantastic. Most people don't know how fantastic fruit is when you pick it tree ripe. And I'm talking anything from plum to peach to cherry to apple to pear. And you get to say, I grew this. This came from my tree. My family grew this. Michael, tell us about what do spots um, have to do with healthy apples? What does this mean to you? Why is that important? Everybody knows the saying, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. And so that was contrived oh, somewhere in the 1800s. But today, that's not necessarily the case. And let's look at how we grow fruit. When we introduce synthetic fertilizers, when we use spray medicines, fungicides, that basically tell the tree, you know, that phytochemistry stuff, the way you resist disease as a tree, well, you don't have to do that. We got medicines for that. What we end up with is emptier fruit, fruit that doesn't have the vitamins and minerals, fruit that doesn't develop all the antioxidants and the, the different phytochemicals that our bodies in turn use to resist disease. And so maybe the saying today is 64 apples will keep the doctor away. But where I'm really coming from with this is, is the notion that when an apple gets a few scab, scab spots, it gets some sooty blotch, it in turn is being stimulated to produce certain phytochemicals to not succumb to that disease. So in a holistic orchard, an organic orchard, where I recognize I can't totally eliminate that, that's a good thing. This is the apple that one a day will keep the doctor away. Next, I hear about research going on at the Wellesley College Botanic Gardens. It sounds interesting, so I decide to stop by. Our, our goal in design and planting is that we want the ground covers to have complete ground coverage by the end of the first growing season so we have far fewer weeds. The whole Botanic Garden is the theme of plants as food and not just for human beings. I am an intern with the Botanic Gardens. I'm a senior here at Wellesley. So today we're working on a lot of different things. We're working on passive irrigation. Um, we're working on filling in gaps in new guilds that have just been planted. We want to get a good ground cover down before winter. Um, a lot of different projects and just teaching people who maybe have never heard about permaculture before but stumbled onto this project, like what we're all about and what we're doing. Around this we've got a bunch of different plants that are really nice. This, this one here, I really love this one. This is called Prostrate bird's foot trefoil or lotus corniculatus, the, called plena, P-L-E-N-A. And you can see it's only about an inch tall, very dense ground cover, nice and fix it so it improves the soil. And you can walk on it, it's, it it'll, it'll tolerate foot traffic. Why do you think uh, permaculture is important? Why are you here today? Uh, I don't, you know, I think permaculture is, at least the way I came across it, or when I came across it, it, it was kind of the first time where I felt kind of this uh, feeling of hope. Um, so about, you know, as far as where our world is going and, you know, solutions um, towards changing that direction, uh, I think permaculture is one of those solutions and, um, you know, I just hope it's not too late, I guess. A food forest, what is that exactly? Alright, so a food forest is like a forest, a woodland. Um, it's a group of perennial trees and shrubs which don't have to be planted year after year like annuals such as tomatoes would have to be. Um, so it's a way of producing food, namely fruit, for humans um, in a way that's less um, energy intensive and less um, chemically intensive. Um, so it's a way that we can produce food for ourselves um, with out having to do a lot of work each year so you plant it and initially it's intensive because you have to get those plants established you have to get the trees established but after that point once they mature then you can have food for maybe 25 years which is really exciting it's funny i thought we had more of the other one the big thing is we're working on forming a network of people who are doing the same kind of thing so everyone who's growing asian pears for example can join our network and we can be taking data on the health and productivity, um, even the nutrient quality of the, the produce from that tree, and try to get, get, get to some real quantified conclusions as to, um, you know, does the presence of sorrel make a big difference, does the presence of comfrey make a big difference, because we'll have a big enough data set. It's all observational, it's not really experimental, but if you add up enough observations you can start getting some statistical significance. and you know, try to understand which variables are most important. 
Um, we've got an American persimmon down here. Got munched by deer, but oh, I'm no. sure it'll recover. Uh, what else do we have? Two chipovas, two jujubes, mulberry, Asian pear, persimmon, papa. Oh, we've got um, Chickasaw plums. There's so much um, yard space in people's back backyards that's not being used for anything other than grass. And I think um, these food forests or food thickets could be implemented on a much smaller scale just in people's backyards in suburbia. There's a lot of unused space there and people can um, learn about the different plants that are native to their area and design food forests that are specifically designed for their climate and their environment. Lawns are stupid. Lawns are stupid. Well, what do you mean by this? Well, I have a lawn. I have about a third of an acre of land and I'm out there mowing it every two weeks and my friends come over and say, oh, look at all the weeds. This is terrible. You got to pull it up and take sod, put it down, and then you'll have a nice lawn and fertilize it. And, stuff. and I just think it's stupid. Why not have something usable that's more attractive, that's more functional, that's better for the environment too. Perhaps lawns are stupid. Next, I meet with a group of volunteers who are transforming a useless lawn into an edible landscape. I attend a permablitz in Portland, Maine. Welcome everybody, thank you all for coming this morning. This is the fourth in our series of permablitzes in the greater Portland area. Around 12.30 we'll, we'll break for lunch. We'll work again, again in the afternoon from 1.15 to about 3.15. Um, we'll start cleaning up around then, that's always a little bit loose ending, but we try to hold 4 p.m. As a, as a firm ending time for folks so that um, we can just make sure that people can, you know, we can respect that ending time. And we have kind of the wild area on the back of the property. We have a few fruit trees and we're going to work on creating a, a bigger foresty area and some plant gilding and um, create some, some great uh, microclimates in that. So, does anyone have any questions about the day or the projects or anything like that? Sweet. <laughs>
taking thousands of man hours practically <laughs> and putting them into just a short period of time to make something awesome. So I think there's a, there's lots of very specific problems, like I think climate change, peak oil, economic instability, um, social justice, questions of social justice, wealth inequality. Um, I think those are all kind of specific problems that in all different ways permaculture approaches to particular communities or, or permacultural solutions. Basically, like permaculture principles can be applied to those problems as solutions. Um, but I also think that just across the board, there's a lot of fear and a lot of um, like paralysis and people feeling like there's really no hope or nothing to do. And so specifically, I think permaculture in practice, the way that we've been doing it today with this type of work party just gives people a chance to connect. It gives people a chance to feel like like there's really something I can like wake up and go do. I think it's it's more than just growing plants. It's more than just providing local food. Permaculture really is that culture piece of things. It's those people coming together. It's creating communities. Exercise too. I mean, I love coming to these things because you get to be intensely involved with people and then intensely involved with a very physical thing and then to see very quickly a tremendous transformation. I mean, I think it's just in, I think it's uh, a really activated group of people that, you know, it brings together a lot of people who are really conscious of what's happening in the world, but then it gives them a positive outlet to be working together and constructing and building the alternative, like building the things that we want to see as opposed to just complaining about and deconstructing the things that we don't. Um, the pear trees are three years old and they bear, they bore fruit this year, uh, the first year, which was pretty exciting. Um, and then we have a cherry tree, which is two years old. It's a little dwarf cherry, um, so it won't get too large, but it's still pretty exciting. And that had a couple cherries on it. Uh, we planted eight hazelnuts today, which we expect to see hazelnut fruit in three years. You know, my, my, my crop of such and such isn't, isn't doing so great this time. Oh, but my neighbor's got abundance of it. So, yeah. you know, we'll swap, you know what sure. I mean? And, and, and we can share. Oh, gosh, you know, share. Gee whiz, we, all have, <laughs> we don't have to all have our own lawnmower and our own snowblower and all like this. We can actually share it. Wow, what an yeah. amazing thing, you know? I mean, we lost that, you know, of this, you know, oh, I need to, the, the ego is taking over and we need these, you know, oh, I need my own thing. And for what? You know, really. Um, so we can, you know, live in isolation, you know. The idea of replacing lawns, which are really an artificial construct with gardens, um, to, is very appealing to me. Any little bit that you can do is, is worth it. I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge scale thing. I mean, if you can start just a little tiny garden, do it. And you know, if you can even start a windowsill garden, do it. Like, it's just, it's baby steps here. Just start with those um, and you won't get discouraged and you can do anything after that. Next. I drive to New Hampshire to meet with Lauren. I've been told that her yard is full of mature fruit and nut trees. In fact, her yard produces enough food to feed her entire family and 500 guests per year. I want to know how much effort it takes her to maintain her trees, and I want to know what chemicals she's spraying on them. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me over here. I really appreciate it. Um, so what do we have here? This is a Myers lemon. That's a very common plant, and I have to ask some friends how to really do it properly. You sure. can see the two little lemons growing. I'm kind of excited about that. This is, these are four different kinds of figs, but you can see um, the little fig on that one, and there's another one in here that has a couple more figs. They're really good. We had some last year. The important thing is is that people don't think that you can grow apples without a lot of organic processes and these haven't had one single thing done to them. Now could I sell them on the market? Nope. But these are for my family, and I can make applesauce, I can make apple juice, I can do pies. Um, we're happy with this kind of quality of apples for doing absolutely no work. 
These are um, Asian pears. And um, I wish I could tell you the variety, but I've forgotten. But um, they're beautiful and they keep really well. Um, we use them just like we would use apples. So we make um, lots of pear pies and pear desserts. Um, and they're just delicious and juicy. Um, and they store really well. And Lauren, this tree is like dripping fruit. How much work have you put into this one tree this year? <laughs> None. Really? I haven't even pruned it. You can just <laughs> see this is a good choice of a tree for this place. Yeah. Um, that this pear really loves it here. And I figured that out so I have three of them, which is enough pears for the whole family for a whole year. And what kind of sprays are you putting on this tree? <laughs> None. I would never put a spray on anything on my property, like poisons, herbicides, pesticides, there is absolutely no reason for the tree. Right now, New Hampshire is only growing about three to maybe five at the most percent of its own food. Everything else is shipped in. Uh -huh. So if everybody had a little garden and a couple fruit trees, it would really go a long ways to what we really mean by resilience and sustainability. As I leave Lauren's house, I think of the thousands of pounds of free fruit grown in her yard each year. I'm amazed that she doesn't spray or prune her trees. I wonder though, what good is it to grow thousands of pounds of food if I can't preserve it? Next, I decide to meet with Kate McCarty, an expert in food preservation techniques. So I did about an um, eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch slice. So the drying time is about six to ten hours. Um, I did some last night for ten hours and they were nice and crunchy. Um, so it really depends on the texture that you prefer. They're dry when they don't feel moist to the touch, like when you squeeze them and no moisture should come out. And then you can also, you should be able to um, fold them so they're still flexible okay. and not have them stick to each other. And now, Kate, the techniques that you're showing us for apples, can this be applied to other fruits too? Yep, you can do all kinds of fruits this way. So when the um, recommended period, is, the time period is up, you just check on your apples. Um, you can see they look dramatically different. They've browned a little because they've been out for 10 hours. So to store your dried fruits, um, you can package them in any sort of airtight container. So that can be glass or plastic. Um, you just have like a Tupperware container. and. Um, these are nice and dry, but if you have some that you think are on the, the verge of not quite being dry enough, package them up and then check on them in a few days. And if you see any condensation inside the container, then just put them back in the dehydrator for a little bit longer. Okay. But these are just going to store in a little Tupperware container. Um, but if you wanted for longer term storage, um, something that's more airtight might be a, a zip top storage bag. Um, so this is a little bit thicker plastic. This isn't like a sandwich snack bag. This is a freezer grade plastic bag. Um, and label and date it because you think you'll always remember that, they'll app that they are apple slices, but it's, and it's 11, 13. Dried apples last about um, for about a year. And again, it depends on the temperature they're stored at. If they're stored at a warmer temperature, they won't last as long, but. Wow, a year. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. After watching Kate, I realize how easy it is to dehydrate fruits and nuts. I'm inspired by seeing so many people planting trees in their yards. But what can people do if they don't own land or if they don't have the money to buy saplings? I find the answer when I meet Ross. It's, it's really fun. You never know what you're going to get from an apple seed. It can be one of 20,000 different varieties. Um, and each apple can be very unique. Some won't end up being edible. Most of them you can usually end up making an apple crisp or something with, but there's also a chance that we could uh, discover something that we've never really seen before, um, a completely different strain of apple. Uh, but basically, it's just, you know, it's great. It's fun to watch them grow, and uh, it's cheap, and it's a good hobby. Uh, basically, I've been uh, just taking apple seeds out of any, any apple, um, cut them apart. Some have a lot of seeds, some don't. This one has very few. Only, only two out of that one, but some of them have much more. He keeps the seeds in his refrigerator for one month, 
to allow them to germinate. Um, and then, uh, so you, just, you take the seeds out, and then after you've taken the seeds out, what do you do with them? You just take recycled um, egg cartons, like this. You know, that way it doesn't cost you anything, you don't have to buy anything from a store. And I just use the bottoms, I guess you could use the top if you wanted to. And you take and you put a few seeds. In each little space. And then I just uh, cover them with dirt, you know, five or six in each one. That way you've got a good chance to get a couple. Well, when I first started doing it, um, I used to use little cups and, and things that I'd actually buy. Um, but as, as you start to do it uh, more and more often, you, those costs add up pretty quick. So um, this just seemed to be an easy way. The cardboard sort of disintegrates and it stays moist so the seeds don't dry out. It absorbs some water too. And uh, it's just a really cost effective way. If you've ever started any sort of gardening, a lot of people will use their egg cartons just because you get them for free. Uh, so I think we're going to go outside and cover those with dirt and uh, lightly water them. And then see what comes up. Um, but you can use stuff that's, that's from your yard. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, and you fill, you know, fill it up. You don't really want to pack it down, you want to leave it kind of loose because when these little seeds crack open there, a uh, little root is going to be very delicate and so it wants to be able to push through the soil. Ross shows me a tray of apple tree saplings that have been growing for two months. You have to keep an eye on them for a little bit, but once they get a foot or so tall, they're pretty self-sufficient and they'll get everything they need uh, from either the rain or the ground. Are you, are you just planting without any permission, Ross? Uh, today we have permission. Today we've gotten permission. Uh, it's it's a, a nice local community here and they're all for healthy, sustainable living. And uh, I think the more trees, the better. I don't have health insurance right now, so the more healthy I can eat, the better I feel and the less likely I am to get sick and so healthy food, organic living is, uh, is my health insurance for now so hopefully I'll be able to afford um, some care someday but until then I mean you just eat healthy, exercise. Hold on one second because I want to take a picture. And uh, we're going to go out in this field and set them down and hope they take. Uh, so in a few years, some other people can enjoy them and whoever comes. Um, this park here hasn't been developed very much, so it's perfect. Uh, if we can get these in the ground, they'll become a fixture for years and years. I, um, we could do it in a line. We could do it in a little patch. Um, we could do it in a couple places. I'd say we, we probably want to plant in two areas just in case one's more prone to slugs and bugs. If we leave them towards an edge, uh, they're less likely to mow, it, mow them down before they get tall enough. Gorilla growing technically is uh, when you grow something out in the wild, usually on other people's land or unclaimed land, and you plant it and you don't really take care of it. You kind of let it fend for itself until it's mature and then you go back and, and uh, take the fruits or vegetables or whatever you're growing out there and it's sort of catching on as a phenomenon. It's been around for a long time, but a lot more people are doing it with, with, uh, with vegetable gardening these days. Especially people who live in the city who don't have land but can come out to the outskirts. And uh, it's basically um, farming on a, a, a small piece of land that you're gonna let sort of run wild, but hopefully what you plant will be what's taking over versus the outside plants that were there before. We got a nice little area we can put um, a row of some in here. So Ross, do you think this is part of the solution is for Americans to just gorilla grow on land that's being that's wasted? I think if they can take over and plant on land that's being wasted, then that's a great way to get started. You know, if you have land of your own, that's even better. There's, there's no real reason why we should be leaving, uh, you know, farmlands and and uh, different lands unused because there's so many people that are unhealthy.
Ross's apple trees are grown from seed, rather than being grafted. That means each tree will be a different variety of wild apple. Ross has proven to me that anyone can plant apple trees without owning any land or spending any money. He has planted 48 apple trees in less than one hour. Over the past several months, I've met with many people who have grown food in their yards and local parks. But what about people who live in cities? Where can they grow food? For the answer, I meet with Courtney of Higher Ground Farm in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, we're standing on the top of the Boston Design Center. It's home to Higher Ground Farm, uh, Boston's first commercial rooftop farm. This summer, Courtney and her partner John installed 1,200 modular planters built from milk crates. We have um, some tomatoes and then this is a, a seeding of arugula that will be ready next week as well as um, some different types of Asian greens which are mustard, mizunas, um, and kale. Uh, we have about nine different varieties of tomatoes that we're experimenting with. Was the roof strength a major consideration? Was that something you had to look into and, and you know, find the right building that had the strength? Um, the things that, the criteria that we were looking for um, to, to find a roof was it had to be a minimum of 25,000 square feet. It had to uh, withstand a minimum of 45 pounds per square foot um, in addition to what you have to deal with for snow load in Massachusetts, which is about 50 pounds per square foot. You know, when we first moved up here, uh, we had five different uh, seagull nests that um, were all getting ready to hatch and the parents were very, very aggressive. <laughs> so they got, they were used to us now and all the youngsters are learning to fly, but um, they were dive bombing us and, um, you know, dropping things on our heads. And, Seriously? Yeah. So, wow. So that was kind of a, a funny one. After seeing Higher Ground Farm, I'm convinced that every vacant city rooftop has the potential to be a garden or a small orchard. Next, I'm told there's a man who's taken a very creative approach to growing healthy food and reducing environmental pollution. This is the original tractor here. This is a solar cub, uh, 50 vintage Farmwell Cub I built about 10 years ago to see if we could run a tractor with solar power. And it's worked very well ever since. So what I'm doing here is running the motor through a tooth belt drive back through the power takeoff and back into the transmission from backwards. Huh. And then I can use all the gears to run the, the tractor the way it normally would. And now, John, is this and, your own design or how do you figure this out? Well, I just figured out how to power electrically <laughs> and when I originally did it I still wanted to have the gas drive coming from the front too to compare the two yeah but I don't do that I've taken the pistons out and everything so I just have the crankshaft this is uh, six batteries up here and then four more back here which gives me a hundred and ten volt series and how much do these batteries weigh what's the weight here okay now this this tractor only has about uh, uh, 700 pounds of batteries in it because they're the small batteries. Wow. And uh, so that's about three quarters of a gallon of gasoline. So it has a 750 watt array on top here, which is about one horsepower coming in when the sun shines directly, which it's not doing today. So this uh, array will charge uh, a whole 10 battery battery pack, which is a 120 volt system in series, which will do some serious work. Why did you decide to do this? What was the, what drove you to do this? This is sort of a test, right? Or yes, well, I've started at this from, as a, from the peak oil viewpoint, realizing that sooner or later, we can argue about that till the cows come home, about when we're going to run out of oil. But sooner or later, and right now, we're starting to go downhill. Uh, there's just not enough oil, like there's been in my lifetime, to, to, to keep feeding people and uh, running our transportation system and our economy and our lifestyle the way we've become accustomed. And we have... Uh, all types of fruit trees, from pears to apples to peaches, apricots. Uh, this this last August, we had our one new peach tree out here had so much peaches on it that it broke the branches. Really? Yeah, it broke them right down, and we, so we had to prop them up. And so how many pounds of peaches did you get from your tree this year, would you say? Well, on one little tree, we probably got 100 pounds. Wow. Yeah. And, and how, many, um, how many chemicals do you spray on the tree? We don't spray any chemicals. 
and how many hours of work do you spend pruning the trees here? Hardly any. Wow. That, that's the beauty of the peach trees. It doesn't enhance GDP when people go to the hospital less. It doesn't enhance GDP when people realize that they're fulfilled in their communities, doing things like growing food and creating music and doing social enterprise locally. We outsourced our dinner to uh, a lot of multinational companies. And we need to take that responsibility back, take that power back into our hands. Rather than have mainstream folks think that, you know, this is the zombie apocalypse or some sort of really negative doom and gloom outcome, what if we've already built living, breathing, functional models of feeding ourselves even here in the city? Any effort to, to bring food front and center and, and source it ourselves as opposed to depend on it to be brought to us by somebody else is a good effort. Our daily choices are as important as our long-term goals. If our daily choices don't align with uh, our environmental concerns, no matter how lofty our long-term goals are, it's not going to matter. But the real solution has got to come from the community and from our culture. There needs to be strong cultural changes. So the idea of having you know, everybody plant three to five trees would be a great way to start. So I think it's about time that plant some trees.